If you have your scriptures, I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. And we're going to look at verse 10, Isaiah 50, verse 10. And before we read the text, last week, uh, Bethany did a wonderful job in beginning a series that we're going to spend the next several weeks on. And we're going to be talking on the theme of faith. And Bethany introduced it. And if we have a, a, a sermon title, or not a sermon title, but a sermon series title, we're going to call it Faith Like a Child. And even though that phrase is not in Scripture, it's implied in Scripture. God has called all of us as believers to enter into a trust walk, a trust rest walk with the Lord. And so there is this thing where God invites us into trusting him in innocence, in simplicity and 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 a, a trust and a reliance on him as our source in every aspect of our life. Um, today, what I'm going to do is I want to minister out of this text. I'm going to be talking about trusting God in the darkness, and we're going to talk about battling spiritual doubt. And you go, well, Lynn, when are we going to talk about childlike faith? Well, we're going to get there. But I felt like the Lord wanted uh, us to focus upon some of the things that can affect our faith and affect our trust, rest, walk in the Lord. Isaiah said this. He said, who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? And the, 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 the person who is the Lord's servant is referring to Jesus, Messiah, in this text. And I think all of us, because we've spent a number of weeks talking about the awe of God and the fear of the Lord, all of us have a desire to give God his rightful place and allowing him to have access to have complete control in our life. Amen? All of us want to surrender more. All of us want to, uh, in faith, relinquish control of our life, uh, which if we don't, we become people that are filled with worry and anxiety. We're a people that live a fear-based, worry-based, anxiety-based lifestyle. And so God invites us into life in the kingdom, and life in the kingdom is about experiencing love, faith, and hope. And you've often heard me say that to me, there's two operating systems that you find in the world. Either we, we function with the operating system of the kingdom of God, which is experiencing the Father's love for you, and faith it, 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 love is like a wellspring that faith comes forth from where as you encounter his love, you're able to trust him with more and more aspects of your life, more and more aspects of your heart, more and more aspects about your dreams and the future that you desire to have. And you're, you're able to say, God, I can trust you with this. I don't have to try to control it. I don't have to try to figure it out on my own. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow you to guide me. And I'm going to allow you to be the master of my destiny. And so then also hope is born because God begins to allow us to begin to anticipate the revelation of his greatness and his goodness in our life. The other operating system that is in the world is an operating system where we operate out of fear, pride, or a combination of both. And we're trying to prove that we're superior to others. And we have to put down others to make us feel significant about ourselves. Or fear torments us to say, you're not enough, you're inadequate, and it causes us to live with insecurity. But... This promise is found in Isaiah 10. It says, whoever stands in awe of the Lord and the fear of the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant, then it says, let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Is it possible for followers of Jesus 
to even though circumstantially your life may not have much light, there may not be much insight on where you're at and where you're going, and you may say, I'm right now in the middle of a nighttime in my life, a moment of darkness where I can't see two feet in front of myself. Is it possible when everything goes dark around you that you can have a faith that is so unwavering, courageous, resilient, that you can walk not knowing where the next step is going to be? Martin Luther King Jr. said this, and this is a paraphrase, not a direct quote, but he said this in his definition of faith. Somebody asked him, what is faith? And he said this, faith is being willing to take the next step even though you don't know where the step, a staircase is. And I love that. Many times God will develop within us a faith, an ability to trust, an ability to believe the Lord uh, uh, to take one step at a time, even though we don't know where the steps are fully taking us. And he says this, let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Now, in the New Testament, when it comes to the word believe, most of the time, that word is translated in the English, the word faith. And so, that is most of the time the vernacular that we use. Are you walking by faith? How is your faith doing? We, we use faith constantly. But in the Old Testament, did you know what? The word in Hebrew is only translated in English, faith, two times in the Old Testament. Do you know what the word for belief is translated in the English in the Old Testament? Hundreds of times. It's the word trust. And so you read passages, trust in the Lord, with all of your heart, we're, we're commanded to trust. And I think there is a beauty because in the New Testament, which was primarily written in Greek, they translated the word believe as faith. And that is that, that in the New Testament, the emphasis upon God revealing truth to you and you coming to know that truth in your heart and in your thinking. That the truth that God is revealing to you about himself is renewing and transforming your thinking, and then it begins to adjust attitude and perspective. But in the Old Testament, the emphasis is upon the walk, not just upon what you know, but upon how what you know is influencing the steps that you take. And therefore, we get this thing of understanding that it's not about the amount of information that I have, because God tells us not to trust in God with all of our head. He said, I want you to trust with all of your heart. Because there, there is an ability to walk this out by faith with, without having all of the information, without having all of the questions answered, without knowing the why behind what God is inviting you to do in taking steps to trust and rely upon him. Now, we know that faith is based upon two primary things according to the scriptures. I want you to go with me over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Very familiar passage of scripture. And this is what many people call the hall of faith chapter because the, the writer of the Hebrews is trying to give examples of what faith looks like, what faith is. Matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, if you want a, 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 a definition for faith, and I say when God defines faith for us himself, it's, it's very important to look at that definition. And I'm sure that in this series, somebody is going to teach out of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. But I want to go to verse 6. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. 
And again, I want to I want to define faith is not just what you know, but how you are responding to God, how you are engaging God, how you are walking out this trust rest walk as he invites you to grow deeper in trust levels uh, with him. And, and the thought that God derives pleasure. He delights in having his sons and daughters trust him with our whole hearts. How many of you have not trusted had seasons where you've not, you've had a situation and a circumstance in your life and you have failed to roll that care, throw that care over onto the shoulders of God and you've held on to it and you've said, God, I don't know if I could trust you with this area of my life. I'm gonna hang in onto that. I'm gonna be the master of my own destiny in, in this aspect and area of your life. And then got you, God brought you to a place of surrender in that area. When you surrendered in that area of your life, you were clutching it, you were gripping it, say, I, I, God, I can trust you with other things. I can rely upon you in other ways uh, and, and other aspects of my life. But this one, I've got to make sure because I've got to, I, I'm, going, I'm going to be the master of my destiny in this aspect of my life. I'm going to make my plan work on this because I need guarantees and assurances that the outcome is what I want it to be. And then God bring you to a place of surrender. And, may, and I, I, I'm not going to go through a litany of list of things that in my own life or maybe areas that you have in your life where God's brought you to that place of relinquishing it and surrendering it and rolling that care over to the Lord. It could have been a wayward child where you as a praying father and mother have this child and you have done everything you can to, to provide an environment to cultivate their heart spiritually. You've tried to love them like Jesus loves them, but yet they're making choices that are the exact opposite of what you've taught them to do. And, and man, I tell you, sometimes we want to go, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let go. I'm going to make sure that I try to, to prevent them from going off the deep end and to becoming a wayward prodigal. There is a moment where those gifts called our children, we, we receive them as a gift, but it is not a gift to own. It's a gift to steward for a season. There is a moment in time in my life, except Karis, where is she? Uh, I'm still wrestling with the release of Karis to the Lord. But, but on all the, the rest of my, that was an attempted at humor, okay, guys? You could at least give me a courtesy laugh. Uh, there is this moment in time where as my children are transitioning from adolescence into adulthood, I realize that, that I've done everything that I could do in the grace of God to provide them an environment and to provide them, you know, uh, what I felt they needed from me as a parent. But there is this moment where I realize that my parenting was not enough. It didn't guarantee the outcome of their future. Because I'm just a a little flesh creature, a human being that is limited both in intelligence and ability. Limited ability to communicate. And so you reach this point where you go, they're getting out of the nest, I've got to let them fly. And God, I have to entrust their life to you. How many of you have faced some financial situations that are pretty intimidating? And you go, okay, God, you said that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider, but also I want you to know that I am also going to try to provide for myself. And I'm going to try to, to, to compensate for what I don't trust you in regards to. And there is this moment where you can work as many hours as you could possibly work and what you do is not going to be enough. You have to trust that God who cares for the birds, the sparrows, and he, he, he closed the fields with the lilies and the flowers. And, and he's out there looking at over all of his creation. And he's taking care of it all. 
every bird that flies, every flower that blooms in the field. And Jesus said, how much more does God care for you? I will provide. And so there is this moment where you just have to say, God, I trust you that you see ahead in my life and you're going to go ahead into my, my future and you are going to, you see my need and you're going to provide for what I need in my life. And so Jesus makes some radical statements. He said, I don't want you to spend one conscious thought upon how you're going to take care of yourself. How many of you want to argue with Jesus over that type of a statement? I want to say, come on, man. You, you don't want me to, to be consumed about, you know, uh, the economy and inflation and about how this is going to affect my retirement and affect, you know, my funds and the stock market and all those things that people sweat bullets over. Jesus said, I don't want you to take a thought about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, how you're going to take care of you because God says, I take care of my kids. And this is what I've learned. This is the lessons that Lynn has learned in his lifetime. Whenever I get all wound up about how it's all going to work out, God brings me to a place and said, you're going to have to surrender your future and the future provision that you need in the future to me. Let me be God in this moment. Can you trust me with your future needs? I appreciate the one or two amens, all right? Come on, guys. So God is pleased when we reach these places of surrender and we allow him to be the provider and the Lord of our life and to allow his greatness and his goodness to stay our heart. But there are two primary aspects of the revelation of God that underpins our faith. Read with me in Hebrews 6. Let me finish reading the text. It says, For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. So there is this thing where God says, When you trust me, I delight in your reliance upon my character and my nature. And I want you that as you trust me, as you roll your cares over unto me, as you allow me to be God in your life, he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to come closer still. I want you to draw nearer to me. Don't stand at a distance. I want you to come closer. And as you come closer, you must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I'm going to read that one more time. You must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Let's say that all together. You must believe that he exists and that he rewards those that seek him. Now, believing in God's existence is, is elemental, but what kind of God exists? Well, if he is the self-existence one, existent one, that means that God is great. It means that he did not, no one created him. He is the uncaused cause. And if he's the uncaused cause, that means that God is great. He's all powerful. Another phrase that we could use is that God is sovereign, that he has authority and lordship Overall, you must believe that he exists. And if he exists and he has the power of an indestructible life, that he's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, then I can declare and I say with the confession in my mouth, he exists and that because he exists, he is great. He has no rival. He has no equal. God is great. But then the second thing that this phrase in this passage revealed, I believe that he exists, but I also believe that he's a rewarder. A rewarder of those that trust him. A rewarder of those that rely upon him. A rewarder of those that draw near to him. And so that informs me that God not only is great, that he's sovereign over all, but that also that he is good. Because you can have a God that is great, but not benevolent. 
But this text tells us that not only is God great and sovereign over all, but that he is good. He desires to bless and empower us with his grace and his goodness. I'm going to wait for a larger amen than that. Now, this message is about battling spiritual doubt. You go, well, Lynn, how is what you're preaching and teaching related to battling uh, spiritual doubt? Well, it's easy to say that God is great and God is good when everything circumstantially testifies to the truth of that. How many of you just had, you were in a season where it was like unparalleled favor, opportunities, open doors, provision, blessings, blessings upon blessings upon blessing. You went from one season of blessing to a new level of blessing, 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 blessing. You were blessed so much that everybody else in the church was envious of your blessings. And when they ask you, what's going on? It's like everything that you touch is just blessed. It's like God is just pouring it out, pressed down, shaken together, running over on you. You know, have you, have you figured out the, the, the mystical steps for blessing, the seven mystical steps to live a blessed life? You're, you're, you, you are blessed more than Joel Olstein is blessed. And everybody else is looking around you and you go, how did they get so blessed? And you turn around and in our cliches, what do we say? When everything circumstantially is going great, people go, man, look at what's happening in your life. And, and you kind of defer it because, you know, you don't want to draw attention to yourself. You'll say, God is great and God is good. God is good all the time, right? And we use these cliches and they're corny, but we say that. Well, it's easy to say God is great and God is good when everything circumstantially testifies to that reality. You've been sharing prayer requests in the prayer meeting and all of a sudden you come back with a testimony, answered prayer, answered prayer, answered prayer. Overflow, blessing, provision, open doors, fruitfulness. And you think you got the faith walk all figured out and now you're ready to teach faith class 101, right? And you come down with the mountain, say, I have the faith, rest, trust, walk all figured out. I'm writing my book on how to walk by faith and get the blessings and I invite you to get the blessings that I figured out how to get from God. But how do we respond when there is no circumstantial evidence of his greatness or his goodness in, his life, in our lives? I find this out. When I, when I first became a devoted follower of Jesus, Jesus had a relationship with me because he was wanting to reveal to me how great he was and how good. It was like I could ask for, you know, ask a request in prayer and get a turnaround time of an immediate answer. Have you seen that in the lives of new Christians where they will just ask, I mean, crazy prayers? And they'll come back to you and say, God answered my prayer. This is amazing. And, and, and you don't want to tell them, this is the honeymoon period. <laughs> I'm glad you guys got that. You don't want to tell them, this is the honeymoon period. This is where God, to show you his greatness and his goodness, is, is going to lavish you and reveal to you his kindness and his mercy and his grace and his love. And he's going to answer prayer. And there's going to be provision. And it's going to be effortless. And you think that this is the way the Christian walk is going to be for the rest of your life. And then some of us old crusty Christians that have been around a while and we've seen a few things and been taught a few lessons. We know that the Lord weans us off, right? 
And he begins to mature our faith from something where we, we, we relate to God as a celestial Santa Claus and as a genie that we rub the bottle and say, come on, genie Jesus, answer this prayer, I want it. And the Lord begins to mature us and saying, listen, I've shown you my generosity. And I've shown you my character, my greatness and my goodness. But now it's time to mature that you understand that this is not about you. This is about the revelation of myself to you and allowing me to transform you and then you having a capacity to not self-center this walk around you but allow it to be centered in me and then as you center around me then that love is going to be revealed to others. So it is in these moments when we walk into a season where there is no circumstantial evidence of his greatness or his goodness that it can be disconcerting. It can be disorienting to us. And it is in these moments when all of a sudden we've been walking in this brilliant, bright, shining light of the greatness and the goodness of God and then all of a sudden the lights turn off and we're now in a moment where we go, where am I? What's going on here? It was so brilliant and so illuminated, I could see far into the future, and now I don't even know what is the next step I should take. It is in that moment where doubts can arise. Now, there are explanations for certain types of doubts arising that is so easy to address. And I'm going to make a statement, and I want to be clear about that. Whenever you have a doubt arise in your life, you must address it. You've got to take it serious. Because if you don't take it serious, that doubt can harden into unbelief, and it can be spiritually fatal to you. And so you've got to address it. I, I want to say this. When we talk about doubts, doubts are not sin. Unbelief is sin. And doubts are not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is the opposite and the extreme of faith. Doubt is kind of this no man's land where you're suspended in a period of wavering and, and you, you see your circumstances and your circumstances testify of one thing and then God, because he's not revealing and manifesting in a moment that his greatness and his goodness to you, you kind of have those questions. God, where are you? Why have you left me in the dark? Other previous times in my walk, there was clarity, there was definition, there was instruction, there was leadership, there was blessing. But now I'm in a period of moment where I don't see any way forward. What are you doing with my life? And, and doubts are always expressed by the question why. And so sometimes there are certain doubts that arise that we can address them real easily. And you go, well, well, how can you address certain doubts easily? Well, sometimes doubts arise because I neglect fellowship. I don't have a life in the Word. I haven't had time of spending time devotionally in intimacy with the Lord in prayer. And so those doubts have arisen because you've neglected certain spiritual disciplines in your life. There are times where we fall short of the glory of God. We all stumble in many ways. And so sometimes we have hang-ups, we have sin patterns, and sometimes we're falling short of the glory of God. And Father needs to bring discipline to our life. And so all of a sudden, the blessing that you are now enjoying, you thought it empowered you to go out and put on a sin bender. Hello? You, you, you got risky with the grace of God. You didn't appreciate or value what, what grace was doing in your life to transform you. Grace does not empower you to continue to live in sin or sin cycles. Hello. But sometimes we can just think we can take advantage of a grace that is free and available to us and we don't think that there's going to be any accountability. And God says, no, because I love you and because you're my son and my daughter, I'm going to be a father to you and I'm going to 
disciplined you. So there is a cause and effect for our sin that we engage in. It's called the principle of sowing and reaping, right? So there, there have been times where all of a sudden the lights went off. The previous blessing evaporated. And I knew why there was a loss of the presence and the grace and the blessing of God. It was because God was saying, you continue to go down this path, I'm not with you. Time for correction, time for faith, you trusting me and not going your own way. And it's time for repentance, which means turning around and going in the opposite direction. There are times where we start doubting what God is doing, but it is our own fault that we've opened those doors for, for doubts to rise because we're trying to do our own thing. But there are other times. And this is where I want to kind of focus within the last five, ten minutes. And I'm going to let you out before it's 103. I want to broach this subject because I think a lot of Christians get very uncomfortable when we talk about pain and suffering in the life of a believer. And sometimes Christians are so uncomfortable with it that we have come to our wrong conclusions in our applications about what God teaches about suffering and pain. So there are whole systems of theology where some believers just go, I mean, they're pain avoidant. I mean, just no, we're, we're not even going to receive that at all. And I want to say this, there are things that the enemy does as a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I also, the flip side of that is to understand this. If you live long enough in this life, you're going to experience pain and suffering. Jesus said, if you live in this world, and, and knowing that this world is a fallen world, contaminated by the curse of sin... He said this, in this world, you're going to experience pressure, tribulation, stress is going to come into your life. And so sometimes churches don't even want to address these issues of how doubt, I'm talking about serious doubt, that it's not the fruit and effect of me sinning, the fruit and effect of me neglecting spiritual disciplines, but, but doubt that emerges in our life as believers when we endure long seasons of suffering and pain. I don't know if you guys remember this, but a few years ago, there was a, a pastor and a missionary in the nation of Turkey that was arrested. He was a church planter, and he was arrested for preaching the gospel. And he was put in prison, and uh, the previous president interceded for him and finally got him released. But he spent two years in a Turkish prison, and he was sentenced uh, uh, for a lifetime. They gave him a life sentence and he would have been in prison unless there was intervention of the United States government. He could have been in there for the rest of his life. And when he got out, it was this happy moment, reunited with his family, with his wife. But I began to listen at him as he was being interviewed by Christian media in our nation. And they began to say, what was it? How did God reveal himself to you when you were in jail? What did the Lord speak to you to sustain you while you were being persecuted for your faith? And there, all these people, interviewers, were asking these questions. And I was stunned by his response. He said, and the, the man, you know, who, who didn't lose his faith, that did not allow his doubts to crystallize in unbelief, spoke honestly and truthfully. He said, I endured two years of silence from the Lord. Now, I know that all of us here, all of us here have had extended periods of darkness where the lights went out. You know, and I, I want to be even so, I, I know a few people know this because I've shared. But when I was living in Iowa, I went through this extreme family ordeal 
that it just broke me in two. In a situation with my parents. And in the aftermath of that, where I was emotionally broken and just went through this period of depression and, and, and discouragement, and normally I'm a person that can fight my way out of it fairly easy, but it, 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 you know, there are moments where you rebuke the devil and he doesn't buke. And I mean, I took authority over every spirit of depression. But there were moments where I wanted to just stay in bed, not get up in the morning. And here I was, pastoring a church, leading a church that was demanding my leadership, needing my leadership, meetings, counseling meetings, you know, ministry, full on. Kayla was there. She knew how busy I was. But there were days where I just gritted my teeth, gutted it out to go. There are, and this may frighten some of you and go, is he stable? Is he stable? But there were moments where I just was like Elijah that prayed, God, would you just allow this to end? I just want to die. And you go, why would you want to die? You have a great family. You have a wonderful wife that loves you. You have friends. You have all these people around you. But there are moments where we have dark nights of the soul. There are these moments where you say, God, why? And then you ask specific prayer that you feel would be according to his will. But it seems like there is no answer. My, my father told me one time that my grandfather, who was also a church planter and also a, a pastor, that his son Malcolm, my dad's brother, contracted polio during the polio pandemic of the 1950s. And my grandfather, who also conducted evangelistic meetings and revival meetings and other places to plant churches, this, this crisis of polio swept through our nation before the advent of the vaccination. And so there was always these people that were bringing their children who contracted the polio virus and they had withered limbs and withered legs and, and collapsed lungs and everything else. And Malcolm had contracted polio and my grandmother and my grandfather fasted for days. They said days on end. And they said that my grandfather constantly was praying, God, would you heal Malcolm? Would you touch him? Would you restore him? And my dad said that my grandfather went to a, a community in Virginia about an hour away and was conducting a meeting while his own family was n n navigating this crisis with his own son. And a, and a child was brought to him who had contracted polio and had a withered leg. And my grandfather was confronted with this parent who said, would you pray for my child? Now he's been fasting, he's been praying, he's been engaging and calling upon God to have his own son be touched by the healing power of God. And my grandfather anointed that child and prayed and was instantaneously healed and the limb was restored. I'm sure everybody was shouting in the room. I'm sure everybody was enjoying the revelation of the glory and the nature of God as healer. But my dad said all the way home, he was in a wrestle. He was in a wrestle with his heart and mind and saying, God, why would you touch this child but not my own son? My brothers and sisters, sometimes the night is long and the night is very dark. How, how do we deal with mystery? Unanswered questions. How do we navigate through this? Well, you know... <laughs> Next week, I'm going to talk about how you have to respond to this type of doubt. Because in that moment, the enemy wants to come in and start questioning, is God really good? Is God really great? You must seriously confront the doubts that will emerge when you're in the dark night of the soul. 
but I don't want to leave us in a negative. I want us to go back to the passage, and I'm going to finish here with this. I want to go back to Isaiah chapter 50, and I'm going to finish this morning. Verse 11, which we did not read when we started the message. Isaiah issues a warning in these moments of darkness. He said, behold, look, pay attention. Because when you're in the dark and you're in the night and, and all of a sudden you're, you're disoriented, the, 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 the response normally to that type of, of conditions is to start creating your own light. And so he said this, Behold all you that kindle a fire, who equip yourself with burning torches, and you walk by the light of your fire. Listen, you have questions, you want to know the reason why, you want to have clarity, you want to have definition. If you're not careful, if you don't turn to God in those moments, if you don't know how to lean in into that moment of pain and allow God to come to you in the form of your need, the tendency and the temptation is for you to try to start building your own fire and walking in the light of your own wisdom and your own understanding. And when you lean on your own understanding, you're going to come to all the wrong conclusions. But Isaiah gives us the answer on what we're to do when we have no light. He said, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on your God. I'm going to say it one more time because I feel like saying it. Trust in the name of the Lord. Can you say that with me? Trust in the name of the Lord. Now, there are two things that reveal to us the nature and the character of God. The name of the Lord that has been revealed to us in the Word. And the Word of God testifies of the nature and the character of God. So we have the testimony of His name and the testimony of His Word. You go, well, what's in a name? There's a lot of power and a lot of revelation in a name. God, in this passage of Scripture, said, I am Yahweh. I am the self-existent one, which means that I am great. I want you to, to trust in my undying greatness, my indestructible life. But, but you know, brothers and sisters, the revelation that Isaiah had is significant and important that God says, I am who I am. Whoever you need me to be, that's what I will be to you when you need me. I will be there. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But the revelation of the name of God has been a continuous journey. How many of you know there is also the name of the Lord, which is El Elyon, God Most High. There is the name of the Lord as Adonai, the one who is the king of above all other lords and kings. But the name of the revelation, the revelation of the name of God has continued. And now in the New Testament, we've been given the name that the Bible says is above every name. And there is a name been given to us in under heaven whereby we might call upon that name and receive intervention, personal intervention. And that is the name of Jesus. Now, I love it when, when Paul ties these two together and he says, I want to introduce you to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to, he brings Yahweh, he brings the Old Testament revelation of the name of God and then merges it with the ongoing progressive revelation of the name of Jesus. And he said, I want to introduce you Paul said, to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this, is, this, is, this has been helpful. It served me in times of darkness. You know, you know what helped me through my prolonged season of pain that I walked through? 
It was learning to trust in the name of of the Lord. There, there was a moment in time where the enemy had me doubting the character and the nature of God, where he was making accusation against God. And there was a track record, there was a history I had in God, but this circumstance, this darkness, this dark night of the soul, the enemy was able to cause me to doubt. But you know what? There was this thing where I went back and I said, you have exalted your word along with your name. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to study the nature and the character of God. I went into the character and the nature of God with a furious appetite where I wanted to absorb everything that God had revealed about himself. And it wasn't just to, again, stock the brain with more theological information. I needed to have a renewed revelation of who God was to me in that moment. This is what happens. God shows up in dungeons. God begins to give you a night vision capability. All of a sudden, God begins to light and fan back into flame a revelation of himself that maybe you had neglected or forgotten, but God begins to freshly reveal to you his character and his nature, and he takes you by the hand and he begins to lead you out. Now, this is what I had to do. I had to go back and say, you know, I, I may question myself in this present moment. Because the enemy always has accusation on two levels. He either accuses you or he accuses God. And normally it's both. Who do, think that you, who, uh, who do you think you are that you have the ability to, to walk by faith. You're a failure. That's all you are. That's ever all you ever will be. Because he wants to cast a shadow on your present to try to get you to give up about your future. Or he will say that, that God's love cannot reach you. God's love cannot change you. You're the lost cause. You're the one that God seeks after but cannot find. But I began to press in. And it became very personal. Where I began to say, either you are my father or you're not. If you are my father, Secure my heart, Daddy. And then what secured me in his fatherhood and the revelation of that that went down to a deeper root system than I've ever had before is I began to reflect upon the finished. I'm talking about the finished. Everybody say finished. When Jesus said it's accomplished, it's finished, he meant what he had to say. And so whenever we begin to confront our doubts, it goes back to what a father did by giving his son as the ultimate act of sacrificial love to display to us, no matter where we're in the timeline of human history, no matter what our circumstances, whether they're good, whether they're bad, whether they're in pain or whether they're in persecution, or whether I feel promoted and successful, it does not matter. I re-anchor myself and I recapture and recenter myself around the cross and what the cross means to not just you but to me it has to be personalized to you and when I began to contemplate upon what God the Father did through the Son that no matter if I have another day of daylight the cross is enough to illuminate my darkness Now you go, what, what's your motivation in all this, Lynn, this series and people that are going to be teaching? I believe God wants to, can I say this? Tribulation proof our faith. You know, there, there is 
this understanding of the last days and how it's going to work out. And there is this period of time in human history that we are accelerating towards, that the Bible has revealed that it's going to be a period of intense times in the earth, that, that Jesus said there will be no days in human history like the days that will be upon the earth before his return. And he said, matter of fact, if he would not intervene personally, he said, no one would be alive on the earth. We're, we're talking about death and destruction at a level that's unparalleled in human history. And you and I may possibly live through these times. And so I feel that it's in. It, 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 it is just, we have an imperative to say, where is your faith? Now, there was a father who had an epileptic child. And he sincerely came to Jesus. And Jesus said, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want my child to be free. And he said, do you believe me? And he said, I believe, but... Help my unbelief. This is where I want us to have humility and honesty when we come down to confronting doubts and the seriousness of them and then how we need to deal with them so that our faith is not destroyed in the days to come. I want us with all humility to be able to say what this man said. I believe. But help my unbelief. Many of us, we, we don't want to admit that we have doubts, we have fears yet, we have anxieties. Some of us, we have some unbelief that manifests over certain aspects of our life. Come on now. It's true. And God doesn't want you to leave that enemy in your life. He wants us to move forward with hope Faith, hope, and love. And even no matter what we face, we can trust in the name of the Lord, relying upon Him because of what Jesus has done. I want you to stand. I don't know if it's 103 degrees, but I'm sweating. I always feel like after I preach, I have to thank everybody. Thank you for your patience. Just in a moment of coming before the Lord, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to show you your doubts. I want you to just ask the Lord, Lord, what, what, what aspect of my life Am I not surrendering over to you to trust you? Still trying to manage it, still trying to control it, fret over it, worry over it. I want you just with sincerity to close your eyes. And just ask the Lord. Is it that I'm not trusting you? And some of you may be in right now a dark night of the soul. All the lights have turned off. You love Jesus. You're in his word. You're praying. You're in fellowship. But right now you're inside. You're groping in the dark. It's a prolonged period of pain. And you go, Lord, I don't know how to get out of this darkness. I want to encourage you, don't try to light your own way. Call upon the Lord. Let the Lord know that 
you trust him, even though you don't know the way out or the next step. Allow him to deepen that rest and trust in him. And so, Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. With all of our pain, with all of our suffering, with all of our darkness, with all of our doubt, all of our fears, all of our anxieties. And Lord, we say, we believe, but help our unbelief. And you just right now, personally, quietly, confess to the Lord, say, Forgive me for not trusting you with my finances. Forgive me for not trusting you with my children. Whatever the area is, forgive me for not trusting you in these aspects of relationship. And just say, Lord, forgive me. Help me with my unbelief. Strengthen my faith. Father, I ask for everyone here that in this moment, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to us your fatherhood. And that you would secure our hearts in your love right now. And even though we don't understand, we will draw near to you and say, Father, I will still trust you. Even though I don't know the answers, I trust you. I am your child and you are my father. I trust you. And so, Father, I pray, God, that you would secure every one of our hearts for those that are suffering, those that are in pain right now. We ask, Holy Spirit, comfort them. Comfort them with your might, with your strength right now. Give them the strength to walk this out in trust and in faith and in rest. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come up, the prayer teams, and I'm going to release you with a blessing. And if anyone needs ministry today on anything, we want you to come and have people minister to you. We want to show love and compassion towards whatever the circumstance. But Father, we just thank you for your blessing being upon us. And we just say, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. May may light penetrate the darkness of your night. As you say, I trust in you, Lord. May the Lord be merciful to you. And may he give you his healing wholeness his shalom, his peace in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 